I've had a couple of people ask me if we had ever done a review of David Gordon Green's first Halloween movie, Halloween 2018. And I thought for sure that we had done it. I'm like, we had a whole like eight hour marathon of Halloween reviews, surely to God. And I went back and no, we had never done an official review of the 2018 Halloween movie, which is five years old at this point. Now we weren't doing the show then. So that's probably why we didn't do a review for it. But since Halloween is upon us, it's time, Uncle Bill. It's time to talk about uh, Halloween 2018. Now, I pulled it out here, boys. The Blu-ray disc. I did see this in theaters. Did you see it in theaters? Shit, I don't even know, man. I can recall seeing it. Sarah and I were, were in Knoxville on like a little mini vacation. And they were playing it at IMAX, one of those big theaters in Knoxville and IMAX. And I was like, holy shit, let's go. And man, it looked fucking killer. Like the, especially the opening credit sequence with the pumpkin and everything and IMAX. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. But honestly, like I went into this in 2018 completely blind because I wasn't keeping up with the news or anything. I knew Jamie Lee was back. Um, but I really didn't know anything about it. I didn't follow who was really even making it, what studio was behind it, who else was in it or anything. So I went in it completely as a fan, as a, as a total mark. I didn't follow like stuff on the internet then hardly at all, like reviews or anything. So I didn't even know what people were saying about it. And I think this was like the first week or so that it was out. I don't know, man. I've always thought this is a pretty solid movie. And even when I go back and rewatch it, I mean, it's not perfect. No, it's got some really like questionable stuff in it, but overall, like in general, it's way better than anything that like Rob Zombie did. In my opinion, the big thing that I notice about it still, when you watch it back today is the beginning, the opening sequence and everything, it feels bigger than those other movies. Yeah. He said, there's some stupid shit in it. The doctor character. That was which, the biggest problem to me. Which yeah. that made no sense at all. But well, let's get into it. So the, the opening of the movie, this is, and for one thing, they're like, there's not even a Halloween two in this version, right? This is just the first movie. Um, so this is 40 years after the events of the first movie. Right. There's a, a podcast team, uncle bill podcast team. That's doing a story on the Halloween murders in 78. And they're in this asylum on the outside. It's like an outside, like recreation area in this insane asylum, I guess. And then they're, they're flashing like all these, like, they really do look like there's something wrong with them. Like some of these people <laughs> that are there. Yeah. yeah. And then Myers is just there with his back to the camera standing. He's an old man. He's bald and gray hair and everything. And one of the podcasters, um, and this is kind of far-fetched. I thought had the mask from, uh, 78. And he was like, look at this, Michael, look at the mask. And I think that's when it cuts to, to the, to the old school style credits with the music and everything. Right. Well, yeah. So I, I think this is like one of the better openings to a Halloween film post, like the first Halloween, of course, but like one of the things that got me about this scene, and I don't know why that took me out of it is so they're, they go to this, this, you know, mental institution. He's in there. They bring the mask. They're talking to him. When they, when they pull out the mask, you can tell it has like an effect on him, but he doesn't say anything or anything. Like that's what they want him to do. They want him to talk, say something. Right. And, but all the, the other, podcast. like all the other mental patients are going like out of their fucking mind. And that's they're, all. Super they're slinging cool. shit and everything. That's that all was like really atmospheric, and then it gets this one guy, and that fucking cracks me up every time. I don't know why he's going, Figaro, Figaro, <laughs> and I'm just like, 
that just takes me out of it, man. <laughs> I don't know why. Like everything up to that point was fine, but I just fucking died laughing. <laughs> And then it cuts to the Halloween music. It's still a pretty cool scene, but I just wish to God they wouldn't. That's something goofy about that. That just the the visuals in that scene is really well done too. Like I remember seeing yeah. it in the theater, I was like, "Holy shit, this is really cool!" And then when that they went back to the, like the first movies, the opening credits, and had the the pumpkin that was rotting or whatever, and then coming back. Yeah, like, I thought that was really cool. Um, it's like i think that yeah he was like really trying to be like a wink to the audience like okay like this is a halloween film like i know what i'm doing you know like i'm i'm going to use the source material not like rob zombie who's just going to shit on everything and try to make it some sort of weird redneck fantasy right uh yeah kind of return to form you get the feeling yeah this is actually going to be a halloween movie you're not going to have some really shitty actors screaming i'm angel daughters I'm fucked up. Uh, Let's listen to some Diamond Head on the radio and talk about how fucked up I am. Fuck Nader. God damn, son. She's awful. Open credit sequence. Then they visit Lori, who is kind of a recluse. She's living out in this gimmicked up cabin in the woods right she doesn't really want to talk to him they bribe her and everything and she's just been hiding out training for michael's return like she's been scarred for 40 years yep because a couple of her high school friends got murdered that night and she's just it's ruined her whole damn life uncle bill let's let's be honest i mean like that would be traumatic that whole situation would be traumatic but 40 years later like i don't know she's still just as nutty as she was right then at that point so also though um she's pulling the linda hamilton really like that's the yeah. inspiration for this clearly and that was a great idea the first time they did it and then every like movie that came out started copying that fucking idea with fucking old stupid Sally Hardesty coming back and getting chainsawed to death, like leather face. I thought Mick Garris did a good job in that. But Lori in this, she's kind of estranged with her family. And this one, she has a grown daughter. It's played by Judy Greer. And then a teenage granddaughter, Allison, who is in, I say Judy Greer is in the second one. And Allison is in all of them. Right. Is Judy Greer in the first one? Judy Greer is in the first one. Yeah, I yeah. know. She's in the first and the second ones. On the oh, place. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. Then we're kind of introduced to that Dr. Sartain, Sartain character who they kind of want to make like a new Loomis. They said that he was Loomis's protege and he studied under him and everything. Right. Um, Who we find out is kind of an evil doctor that's, you know, wanting to you know, get in my, get in Michael Myers head and figure out what the hell is going on and everything. I think that that guy has like an awful Donald Pleasance Im- Im- impression throughout this I whole do too. movie. Like, like that to me is the biggest part of the problem with this movie really is that character. I'm not sure if they were going for like a straight rip off of like Donald Pleasance. I don't know why they needed to have a doctor that was like, you know, had an accent and fucking you, had an obsession with Michael Myers again, but Mm-hmm. They did. Myers escapes though while they're transporting him on a bus. Pulls who? What the hell? How's that yeah. happen? There's a there's a wreck of some sort. There is a scene and I remember they hit a I, deer or something or a fucking I, I, moose. They hit another cow, maybe. Yeah. Where Michael kills like a younger kid in this. And yeah, I was like, that well, does that's, happen. That's a first. I don't think it. You know, this kid's probably twelve or thirteen years old. And I thought that that, I was like, wow, I mean, that's kind of ballsy. Us Rex, they escape and everything. And Michael is loose in Haddonfield again on Halloween night. And when he starts his rampage, I thought that that was the coolest fucking shit. Like the way it was filmed and everything. That was, yeah, that to me was probably the best part of the movie. Yeah. Soundtrack. John Carpenter did the soundtrack with his son in this, Cody. And uh, Cody. Uh, and, uh. I think that that's great. I thought that the soundtrack was amazing. I mean, they used some of the classic music, 
but they also had some new music that kind of went with the classic music. Michael's mask in this one too. Chris Nelson, who did the makeup effects in all these movies, um, pretty much went with the classic Myers mask, but aged it into like, you know, had heavy damage and weather on it. Um, I really like the mask a lot. I know some people were hoping that they would just, because there's photos of the actual Myers mask today that was used in the first movie that they would actually just go and make a replica of exactly that and use that, which would have been cool too. But I thought that the mask that they went with was pretty damn killer. Well, it's like, it probably one of the better masks. Yeah. That they've actually had. Yeah. Cause it was essentially supposed to be the original mask just aged. So have you gotten to the bus wreck part? And then like what happens with yada yada and then killing the kid kills and the then... kid. So that to me is out of like character for Michael Myers. Like he never really kills like young kids or anything, but whatever. Uh, I guess he killed his sister when she was what? 16. How was she supposed to be? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, whatever. 16, 17. It just seems odd anyway. Uh, so he gets loose. He's of course loose on the town and what have you. And he yep. goes on the killing spree, which is the best part of the whole movie where he just, he literally is just in a, in like a one shot, you know, like a, like a kind of like a dolly shot, just going from house to house, breaking into the houses and just killing like whoever's in there, which is what you would imagine that Michael Myers would fucking do. Like that would kind of be the, the thing, right? Yeah. With just no sense to it, no like, no motive, just random senseless kind of violence because that's what he was doing. That's what, that was his whole gimmick. And there's a lot of really cool like death scenes within that. Is it really too bad that Corey Cunningham went in all three movies? Here's my problem. I think he, I'm hoping he's being sarcastic. Well, this is one of the problems. So it would be one thing if Corey Cunningham was actually a character in one of the other movies. But he wasn't. The whole problem, though, is is they just introduced that character in the last movie like we were supposed to give a shit. Tony Moran was in a couple of scenes in Kills, wasn't it? Kills? But it's flashback scenes. They did not film new stuff with Tony Moran. They knew better than that. With me in Halloween 2018, me and my wife and my brother-in-law actually all went to the big IMAX theater and watched it. I've always liked 2018 of the three. That was the strongest one. In my opinion, it's the one that actually like flowed the best that had, like it did have some stupid shit in it. Like the Dr. Sartain thing where he's, who knows what the hell that was. That was kind of dumb, but overall of the three movies, that was the, um, the strongest one easily some of the traps and stuff in Lori's house was kind of far-fetched that uh she'd have like gas lines hooked up and trap doors in her basement and like this fucking moving shelf thing that would cover her basement up and shit i mean i'm be honest i thought that was really cool the idea of like there's lots of precedent for that with like you know not running on street shit just setting up like booby traps but the fact that she like wired her whole house to be like one giant booby trap that would, you know, just for that particular reason. So she would eventually like one day, you know, be able to catch him. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the idea that Jamie Lee Curtis is in this and she's not trying to be like, she's a basket case. She's not even trying. She's more of a basket case in this than she is an H2O in which she was kind of trying to play like a nineties version of a basket case. But in this, it's kind of like more realistic like the way that she plays that role. Uh, I do not like Judy Greer. I don't know why. I just never like Judy Greer, any, much anything. Uh, she's okay. I don't Judy, like the Judy, granddaughter, Judy. Allison. I don't like, I just don't like her role. I, I don't know. Cinema side says that uh, he feels like David Gordon Green and Danny McBride had a good idea for just one film. <laughs> well, if you think about it, 
Okay. <laughs> probably the case. So if you think about it too, it's like they had how long probably to write that movie and to come up with those ideas. Probably a long ass time. And then it did so well, and probably the studio was like, "Well, we got to have like a sequel immediately." Well, didn't and they already announce it was three movies though, right? When they initially announced Jamie they, Curtis, there ain't no fucking way, man, that they sat down and wrote that out as a trilogy, unless they are just like the worst goddamn writers of all time. Because that second movie I, looks no, like something somebody put together in like ten minutes. I don't think that they wrote it as a trilogy. I'm just saying that whenever they signed that deal, I think it was for three movies. Oh yeah. Well, that's probably true, but yeah. Like, so, but leading up to 2018, like they had all the time in the world to write like something that would be at least coherent. And then they had to make like a sequel in probably six, eight months or something. She was the Kevin McAllister of Halloween for sure. Uh, the very end how they trap him down there and try to blow the house up and everything like i thought that was a great ending as well and i did too it should have ended that should have been in the fucking whole thing really like well i mean they did leave it open for a sequel though at the end too um but (laughs) where they went with kills and i actually like looking back at it at least kills has that flashback scene and stuff but like i just I remember when you and I watched it in the theater, I was like, what in the fuck are they doing here? They didn't know. What is they, had, they didn't know any more than we did. Yeah. I was really trying to figure out like while when we were watching kills, like, so what it seemed like is like, they were just like, when we do this next movie, we're just going to f- say, fuck everything that has to do with any kind of plot or anything. And we're just going to kill as many people as possible. And that's why we'll call it kills. That was like probably the extent to which they thought about what they were doing in the movie. And we'll have some bullshit about, you know, mob violence and all that stuff and how it's bad. And yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And then I don't know what the fuck they were doing with Halloween ends. Like I've still yet to figure that out. They're just like, like, Hey, we've got to end it somehow. Let's do this bulls. I, you, you know, uh, David Gordon Green gave an interview before the movie ever came out saying that he knew people weren't going to like it. <laughs> so he was expecting it. Yeah. With Halloween Ends, there's really nothing that redeeming in that movie at all, especially no. for Halloween fans. There's no buildup for really anything that you care about in it. With Kills, it was just a stupid slasher movie. And that's pretty much what they were, I think they were going for there. And it kind of delivered in that aspect. I mean, the, the mob thing and the evil dies tonight, like that was awful. Anthony Michael Hall's a shitty fucking actor too. I can't stand him. Like, I can't believe they hired him in that movie. Yeah, he was bad in that. Yeah. Yeah. 2018 is easily the best of that trilogy. It's weird too, because like they had, uh, a good movie. I won't say it's a great movie, but a good movie that they could build something off of right in Halloween 2018. And they could have gone so many different directions with it. And I'm just utterly confused about why they chose to go with those two movies. Like yeah. I have no idea. Give us the thumbs up. Off you butts. Like, subscribe. And if you subscribe, here's something else you can do. Once you subscribe, you can click the bell notification, right? And it'll notify you anytime that Dead Pit puts up new shit. Or don't. I really don't give a fuck. Do I want you to. I want you to. <laughs> I don't care. Let's keep our community growing here on I, YouTube. I don't, I don't like it. I don't want you to do nothing. Listen, I need to do that. No, don't you dare do it. Thumbs up. Subscribe. Click that bell. There's all kinds of wonderful shirts over at shop.deadpits.com. Simply the best horror shirts on T Public. There are others, but they all suck. You can get some Dead Pit Radio shirts. You can get Last South on the left. The Hills have eyes. Texas Chainsaw. Oh, wait, you can't say Texas Chainsaw. All kinds of shirts, folks. You're going to love them. Shop.deadpit.com Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Deadpit on Patreon.com is the only place to check out 
a complete archive of the old Dead Pit radio shows all the way back from 2005 on, in addition to the midweek shows, fan commentaries, exclusive podcasts, and much more. Dead Pit on Patreon.com if you're interested. Tears started at only $1. We yeah.